After building up to the finale through four acts of emotional turbulence and drama, we are going to finally witness fate take its course in Act 5, with Romeo and Juliet's misguided attempts at finding love amidst a riotous community. Hi everyone, I'm Buff English, and I'm here to buff up your English skills by telling you everything you need to know about some of the world's greatest literature. Today, we're discussing Act 5 from Romeo and Juliet. This act starts with us returning back to Romeo. We haven't actually heard from him since back when he kissed Juliet goodbye at the end of Act 3. Romeo, if you recall, has been banished from Verona and is hanging out in the city of Mantua, which is about a day's ride from Verona. And now all the events of Act 4, namely Juliet's faked death, are about to catch up with him. Before any of that, however, we are reintroduced back to Romeo with him experiencing another premonition. In Act 1, he was telling us about how he had a dream that the fate of his life was about to change, and he begins Act 5 by similarly reporting, I dreamt my lady came and found me dead. A bit morbid, but he is in a chipper mood. Next, though, Romeo's friend and servant from Verona, Balthazar, comes to visit and doesn't mince any words. Balthazar, we learn here, was also privy to the fact that Romeo and Juliet had gotten married, so there was at least one other person other than the nurse and friar who knew about their secret relationship. He immediately reports to Romeo that Juliet is dead, he saw her body himself being taken to the Capulet's family tomb, and no, there are no letters from the friar. Got that? Romeo has not heard from the friar. So even though Juliet's death is faked with the hope that Romeo will come to rescue her, Romeo does not know that. We already know that Romeo is a kid who is quite prone to impulsive, emotional reactions to circumstances, so it's no surprise when Romeo tells Balthazar that they are going to sneak back to Verona. And sure enough, as soon as he's alone again, the next words out of Romeo's mouth are, well, Juliet, I will lie with thee tonight. And he's going to the apothecary's shop to purchase poison. And once he has said poison, he speaks to it and ends the scene by saying, Go with me to Juliet's grave, for there I must use thee. We saw Romeo nearly suicidal in Act 3 when he felt all hope was lost, but was saved by the calm mentorship of the friar. Here, though, there is no friar or other more rational, sobering presence in Romeo's life. Left to his own emotional devices, he immediately returns to his overreactive, suicidal flourish. We should be wondering at this point, wasn't Friar Lawrence supposed to send Romeo a message explaining everything? Why did Balthazar report Juliet's death instead of Friar Lawrence report Juliet's fake death? Now Romeo thinks that Juliet is actually dead and he is emotionally flying off the rails. But this could have, should have, been prevented with a simple letter. This question is quickly resolved for us in scene two when we meet Friar John. Apparently, Friar Lawrence did, in fact, write a letter explaining his newest plot to Romeo, and he entrusted Friar John to deliver the letter, but in what seems to be the strangest twist of fate in the whole story, when Friar John was looking for a friend of his to travel with, basically the medical police, the searchers of the town, thought these guys were in a house where there was a contagious disease and they were quarantined inside of this house. Friar John could not leave and the letter could not be delivered. Then, once he's released, he goes back to Friar Lawrence instead of to Mantua. I l would love to watch the look on Friar Lawrence's face when Friar John hands him back his own letter. So, not only did Friar Lawrence entrust his entire plan to the timely delivery of a letter by a friend, but the most unlikely scenario of Friar John getting temporarily quarantined intervened. And now Lawrence realizes the severity of the situation he's helped facilitate. Juliet is about to wake up, and Romeo, dear Romeo, who we all know acts recklessly sometimes, is probably hearing that Juliet is actually dead. So the friar just decides to write another letter to Romeo and to meet Juliet in the tomb so she doesn't wake up alone. It's for reasons like Friar John's detainment that many people point to fate playing the ultimate role in sabotaging Romeo and Juliet's love. We'll make more of this at the end, but it's worth considering to what extent fate or the character's choices themselves played a role in the story's outcome. No one could have predicted that Friar John would have been inhibited from delivering the letter, but were there other choices, big and small, such as John's decision to find a friend, Lawrence's decision to entrust this message to someone else, Juliet's decision to go along with whatever Friar Lawrence suggested, Capulet's decision to force Juliet's marriage to Paris, Romeo's decision to confront Tybalt in the street, and so on. Were these decisions made with the most rational and well-meaning motives, or are these often the choices made by impetuous, flawed, and ill-motivated individuals? 
And now the final dramatic scene of the play begins in the graveyard and vault where Juliet is buried. Interestingly, it begins with Paris secretly coming to visit Juliet's grave with flowers. No matter how we interpreted him earlier in the play, the fact that he visits Juliet's grave alone at night with tears distilled by moans shows us that he authentically cared for Juliet and honorably has come to pay his respects. It's hard to interpret his actions as otherwise and earns Paris a place in the play as one of the more innocent and purely motivated characters. But sure enough, Romeo arrives right after Paris. When Paris is warned by his servant that someone is coming, Paris is like, who else would be coming here right now? And he hides. Romeo tells Balthazar, somewhat ominously, that he is about to go into Juliet's crypt to pay his respects, and Balthazar is absolutely under no circumstances permitted to come down into the crypt with him, no matter what. We have a few levels of dramatic irony here. For one, we know, but Romeo does not, that Paris is also present. Secondly, we know, but Balthazar does not, that Romeo plans on committing suicide beside Juliet's body. And thirdly, we know, but both Romeo and Paris do not, that Juliet isn't even actually dead. These layers of irony collude to generate the intensity of the scene, keeping the audience on the edge of their seats, knowing that one by one these characters will be confronted with the same truths we already know. When Paris recognizes Romeo, he's furious. What other conclusion would be reasonable for Paris to draw except that Romeo, as a Montague, has come to do some further damage to the Capulets? Paris already knows that Romeo killed Tybalt and that Juliet allegedly died due to grief of Tybalt's death, and he knows that Romeo is supposed to be banished, so he leaps out and tells this much to Romeo. Romeo tries to talk him down and hints that Paris shouldn't kill him because he's already committed to killing himself, but why should Paris believe him? So Paris makes an honorable but misguided attempt to apprehend an unwilling Romeo. These two lovers fight to the death, right inside the Capulet's tomb. Again, there are a few layers of meaning and interpretation here. They're both under the belief that Juliet is dead, but she's not. Paris is trying to kill Romeo, who went there to die anyway. And Paris believes that Juliet was his almost lawful wife when she was already married to Romeo, and they're both trying to live up to their ideals. Paris to defend the woman and family he almost married into, and Romeo to defend his access to and perceived honor of Juliet. We get no indication that Romeo even faintly recognizes Paris at this moment, calling him only youth. And neither one of these guys knows that Juliet herself is about to wake up. So it's all one big messy pile of confusion, lies, ignorance, and misguided morality that brings death into this scene. Romeo kills Paris. For Romeo being very much the lover boy, he ends the play 2-0 and in his fights, which is saying something. I don't want to make too much of it, but perhaps it suggests that Romeo is just as fanatic with his violence as he is with his love, that he can kill as devastatingly as he can emotionally overcommit. Or perhaps his ability to commit violence is exactly what worries him. Maybe he's too much like his fellow Montagues. And just as Juliet flees the expectations of adulthood by running into Romeo's arms, Romeo runs into her arms to escape the otherwise violent passions he knows brood within him. But again, I don't want to make too much of this. Of course, after he kills Paris, Romeo recognizes him. Paris, we should note, is related to Mercutio and therefore related to the Prince of Verona himself. Romeo, realizing this, regrets the hasty carnage and announces to the now dead Paris, Oh, give me thy hand, one writ with me in sour misfortune's book. He parallels himself to Paris and again attributes the tragedies they all experienced to fortune. We can't help but feel a little bad for Paris at this point. An unnecessary casualty, another character falling victim to Shakespeare's fifth act. Once Romeo lays Paris in the tomb, he turns his attention to Juliet. And the audience just has to be squirming at this point. Juliet is alive and about to wake up, but Romeo, thinking her dead, ironically says things like, Beauty's ensign yet is crimson in thy lips and in thy cheeks, and death's pale flag is not advanced there. And why art thou yet so fair? Well, of course she still looks somewhat alive because she is. And now Romeo, in his final soliloquy, slips back fully into the dramatic flair of diction that he has demonstrated so often in the play, poetically flourishing his last lines of love over Juliet's body. Before he drinks the poison, he kisses Juliet one last time, symbolically calling back to their very first encounter when he kissed Juliet during their initial conversation in Act One. We might have expected at some point for Romeo to change course and relinquish these over-the-top feelings he's latched onto Juliet with, just as we saw him capriciously love Rosaline at the beginning, only to fall immediately for Juliet moments later. But Romeo seems to possess a power few of us do. 
he fully commits himself to his emotions. The world of his feelings and experiences is far more real to him than the real world itself. Only when other characters, such as Benvolio or Mercutio or the Friar, offer reason and perspective to Romeo is he able to counter what on his own he takes as rigid truth. His suicide here represents the ultimate and tragic outcome of his adherence to such ideals, of his unwillingness to bend the truth of his love and commitment even a fraction. And because of this stubborn, inflexible resoluteness, Romeo dies, and Paris dies, and in a moment, Juliet dies. And of course, who shows up right after Romeo dies? Friar Lawrence. He meets Balthazar in the graveyard and learns that Romeo has been in the vault for half an hour already. And yet another moment of, oh, this can't be good, Lawrence dashes inside of the Capulet's tomb in a crescendo of frightening discoveries. First of torchlight, then blood, then swords, then Romeo's body, then Paris's body. Then... Amidst this horrifying scene that the friar is standing over, Juliet's eyes flutter awake, and she asks for Romeo. The friar is panicking now. He hears more noise outside, and it seems like more people are coming. People who will discover what has happened. There is no more lying or conniving his way out of this. He tells Juliet, A greater power than we can contradict hath thwarted our intents, and urges Juliet to get up and run away with him to a nun's convent. She, wisely, refuses this final offer to escape. The friar, who has been at the center of this juvenile attempt at love, makes a mad dash away from the vault, leaving a confused, surprised young girl alone with her dead family, her dead husband, and her dead suitor. We get a sense that Juliet sort of has the opportunity to make sense of these things. After all, she heard from the panicked friar, sees Romeo's dead body and warm lips, and finds his vial of poison. But everything is so rushed and frantic in this moment that she never verbally pieces things together. Instead, she quickly tries to drink what's left of the poison and, finding none left and hearing footsteps outside, grabs her dagger and ends her own life. The speed with which this happens is stunning. Juliet, the idealistic yet practical young teen, jumped into Romeo's arms, jumped into marriage, jumped into the friar's questionable plan, and jumped to death, all with relatively little consideration and much hurried idealism. While Juliet is definitely a victim of her own overwillingness to commit herself to Romeo, she's also arguably a victim of the flaws of all the other characters in her life. Her vacillating father, her aggressive cousin, her witless nurse, her idiotic friar, and most of all, her alluring, dramatic lover, Romeo. While Romeo's courage for sneaking into her family's party, his handsome face, his charming pickup lines, and his poetic, romanticized way of viewing the world were all naturally appealing to a young girl who otherwise was captive to the world her family wove for her, we have to admit that Romeo was a horrible example to her. On the surface, he represented the peace and love and magnanimity that was so sorely needed between the Montagues and Capulets, but his lack of self-control and thoughtfulness ultimately led to rash actions that pulled Juliet down too. His killing of Tybalt in a violent rage, for example, led directly to his banishment in Juliet's betrothal to Paris. His willingness to trust the friar's first plan to secretly allow the couple to wed led to Juliet following his example and blindly trusting the friar's next plan to stage her death. And ultimately, Romeo's suicide led to Juliet also following his example without qualm or disillusion. The final events of the play bring many of the remaining characters together. The Prince, the Capulets, and Montague all converge on this gory scene and discover a gruesome, tragic mystery. Why would Paris, Romeo, and Juliet, who was supposed to have been dead these past two days, all be in a bloody pile in the tomb? Both the Friar and Balthazar are apprehended and brought before the Prince. The Friar, for once, although it's way too late at this point, is finally honest with everybody and tells the whole true story of Romeo and Juliet from beginning to end. I can't imagine what the looks on the faces of the Montagues and Capulets must have been to learn that Romeo and Juliet were married and that the Friar had withheld all the story's details from everyone this whole time until now. Balthazar and the Prince's page are also brought before the Prince and share their testimonies, and Balthazar produces a letter Romeo had asked him to deliver to his father, which turned out to be a suicide note describing the whole set of affairs. The Prince brings the Capulets and Machiavellis together and sums up the tragic deaths. See what a scourge is laid upon your hate, that heaven finds means to kill your joys with love, and I, for winking at your discords too, have lost a brace of kinsmen. All are punished. Everyone has lost two family members over the past few days. The Capulets lost Tybalt and Juliet. The Montagues lost Lady Montague and Romeo. Uh, that's right, Lady Montague, we are told, passed away from grief. And the prince himself lost Mercutio and Paris. 
This grotesque cavalcade of death gives us new meaning to the phrase fair Verona from the prologue, and perhaps it is fair in the end after all. Montague and Capulet, in their catastrophic grief, join hands, bringing to fruition the prologue's preview that Romeo and Juliet doth with their death bury their parents' strife. They promise they'll make statues of one another's child and peace with one another. I can't help but think back to the friar's words in Act Two when he agrees to marry Romeo and Juliet. He says he'll agree to it for one reason, because maybe it will help make peace between the families. Well, friar, you got what you wanted. But because there was literally no plan for how to actually use the marriage to make peace, it seemed like fate, or human flaws, or idiocy, took over and did the rest of the job for him, with tragic results. And we also can't help but think back to Romeo's ominous premonition at an Act One before entering the Capulet's party. He says, My mind misgives some consequence yet hanging in the stars shall bitterly begin this fearful date, and predicts his own death. But, in true Romeo fashion, despite these misgivings, he thrust himself nobly onward toward his love-blossomed doom. As with most of Shakespeare's plays, the final lines are given by the character able to make peace and move forward. In this case, the prince. What's interesting, though, is that he abstains from making any final judgments in this moment, declaring, Go hence to have more talk of these sad things. Some shall be pardoned, and some punish it. But dismissing everyone until later on. This opens up the discussion for the characters, and it's almost like the prince is speaking to the audience here, too, to go and discuss the course of events, to determine who the guilty and innocent parties are. To what extent did each character's decisions and motives drives the story toward its tragic conclusion? And now we've reached the end. The prince's famous final words are, For never was there a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. The obvious woe, of course, is that our main characters possessed a drive toward love that led to their very avoidable death. But there are other woes here, too. The unnecessary loss of other lives, the inevitability of fate dictating outcomes, and the intrusion and dark lessons taught to us of human vice. There's a lot to cry over and contemplate at the end of Romeo and Juliet, and hopefully an attentive audience will come away having learned a bit more about love, honor, community, idealism, pride, virtue, youth, family, and many other universal aspects of life. And now, with much woe, we must say goodbye to a Romeo and Juliet series. What did you think of the story? Was it fate and bad luck that led to the outcome? Or who in your mind should be pardoned or punished? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And thanks for watching. Be sure to visit more of Buff English and check out our other playlists. And until then, parting is such sweet sorrow.